Now, in the movie, you said uh, in quantum theory, you can also go backwards in time. So I asked uh, David Albert about that, and he said, well, no, quantum theory doesn't say you can go backwards in time. He says the equations of physics have time reversal symmetry, but you can't really go backwards in time quantum, which seems to be different than what you said. So could you elucidate on? Yeah, we actually talked about it at the uh, cocktail party last night. Oh, you did? And uh, we agreed that there may not be anything such a thing as time except in consciousness. In other words, outside of consciousness, there may not be a flow of time. Time may exist, but not in terms of flowing in a direction. There may be only this now, this individual now, and then maybe another now and another now and another now, and we connect them through memory and so forth. But outside of consciousness, there may not be a flow of time. So the laws of physics allow time symmetry, reversibility, and so forth. The way I think of it is that consciousness gives our classical world a flow of time. But in the quantum world, time doesn't flow. And therefore, we can, from our perspective in the classical world, or at the edge between the classical wor world and the quantum world, time seems to be going backwards. Now, for example, in the classical, well, in the quantum, in the historical EPR experiments, in which you have two particles that are in superposition and entangled, and you send one over this, this way and one over this way, and make a measurement here, this one instantaneously reduces to the complementary uh, uh, situation. So there's some kind of instantaneous communication, which would be faster than the speed of light and prevented by relativity. So what a number of people have suggested, Ben Schumacher, Roger Penrose, and others, that the information here goes backwards in quantum the quantum information goes backwards in time to when the particles were unified and then forward in time to bring the quantum information. Now, going backwards in time is a problem uh, in terms of causal paradox, because if you could go backwards in time, you could go back and kill your grandfather and you wouldn't be born. But quantum information doesn't really convey that sort of information that sort of signal, it's more of a correlation. It's more of a qualifying modification of classical information. So I think it's, it plays a role in consciousness in terms of modifying information and making it conscious. You know, there are many things that the brain does um, that, that we do that the, the perceptions seem to take longer to occur in the brain, and we've already responded to them. Rapid conversation, you say something and before my brain has actually processed and come to conscious realization of what you said, I've already responded. Hitting a baseball at 90 miles an hour is physically impossible according to the perception time in the brain, and yet people do it. There are many illusions that, that occur that, where the brain seems to know in advance what will happen. Ben Libet's famous experiments also suggested that subconscious information goes backwards in time. So, Quantum information, when I say quantum information goes backwards in time, you could say equivalently that in the quantum world there is no such thing as the flow of time, and that in the classical world we have the illusion of a flow of time due to consciousness ratcheting forward and with a sequence of nows that follow one another. Now, if I was just someone on the street and I heard that, they'd say, well, wait a minute, you say time doesn't really, it's only consciousness. I mean, that's then that's the old... Uh, question if the tree fell, would someone hear it? So if someone dropped a basketball on the basketball court and no one was there, there was no consciousness involved, would the ball still fall? Because the ball seems to fall through different states as time moves right, forward. Right, right. Uh, yes, I think so. And, uh, um, but that would mean that there's a sequence of nows, but maybe only when somebody becomes aware of it. Um, it depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. If you are a Copenhagen uh, person, you would say, no, there's a quantum superposition of multiple possibilities, and the ball, the ball doesn't fall until somebody observes the ball falling. If you are a decoherence person, you could say, yes, it falls because uh, it collapses to one possibility. And if you are an objective reduction person, you would say also that it falls because uh, it has uh, reached the threshold for, for collapse, or it is decohered. So yes, I would say that it, that it falls. So um, that's a good question. I would, but I, I stand by what I said that, that consciousness gives the, because the other way to say it is that the ball could also go backwards and um, against, against, well, that doesn't really make sense. So I don't know. Okay. Because <laughs> um, yeah, it's a real, it's, you know, a, a real head scratcher. Um, what was the... Excuse um, me. Well, let me, let me just make one more comment, because yep. I didn't really handle it very well. 
Um, the second law of thermodynamics says that things unwind and move forward. So that gives an arrow of time. But at the quantum world, in the micro world, the second law of thermodynamics doesn't seem to hold, and things can, can go backwards or be timeless. So in the quantum world, um, there's no flow of time, whereas in the classical world, there is. I think that's probably a better explanation. So if there's no flow of time, are there any, um, what experimental uh, data is out there that seems to suggest that, that time is funky down at the quantum level? Well, even in the classical world, Wheeler and uh, Feynman showed that time was symmetrical and that every that electromagnetic uh, uh, information goes forwards and backwards. But the backwards information is only perceived by what they called the coherent absorber. And what a coherent absorber, they didn't explain, but uh, Dick Behrman, a physicist in, in the Netherlands, has suggested that consciousness is such a coherent absorber which is uh, capable of receiving backward-flowing information. So only consciousness receives this backward information. So then, of course, the question now remains, what is consciousness? Ah. Ah. Yeah. Well, I define consciousness, according to Penrose's view, it's a particular type of self-collapse of the wave function. Now, as you know, things can be in superposition of multiple possible states or locations. That's quantum superposition, and that's the natural state in the quantum world. Now, we don't see that in our classical world. Why not? Well, one explanation is that conscious observation causes collapse. That's the Copenhagen interpretation. Another is that every superposition branches off and forms a new universe, the multiple worlds hypothesis. Another is that interaction of superposition with the environment causes decoherence. And the fourth possibility is that superpositions grow until they meet some kind of natural threshold inherent in nature, which causes them to convert from the quantum superposition state to the classical state. There are several types of, of these theories which are called objective reduction, an objective threshold for quantum state reduction. One is if the system grows too large, that's the uh, girardi rimini weber GRW theory. Another is Roger Penrose's idea that well, first he starts with a question, what is superposition? And he says it's a separation in fundamental reality at the most basic level. So much like the, the uh, multiple worlds view, the, separate, the universe separates and begins to separate, but that these separations or bubbles, if you will, in, the, in, in reality it's most, at the most basic level are unstable and after a while will collapse to one or the other. And that this type of collapse, this type of objective reduction that occurs due to this instability and the separation of the universe is consciousness. And it can only happen in very special circumstances because you need a system that's isolated from the environment, so it doesn't, it has to be protected, so it doesn't decohere, and it has to be large enough to reach this threshold. The threshold is given by, it's inversely related to the size of the superposition. So something very small, like an electron superposition, if protected from decoherence, would take 10 million years to reach threshold, and then it would have a very dull, tiny moment of consciousness. Uh, something very large will reach threshold quickly. And in the brain, we think that quantum computations occur which reach threshold roughly at 25 milliseconds. So 40 times a second, we have conscious moments, uh, collapses, these self-collapses, in which the superpositions collapse to the classical world. And it's a process occurring at the most basic fundamental level of the universe at the Planck scale, basically, connected to the brain by quantum computations occurring in our brains. So <clears throat> it almost sounds like you're saying that consciousness arises out of having a brain. Well, not necessarily. Well, it helps. But uh, any superposition that reaches threshold for self-collapse would have this. But And it could happen in a neutron star, which have very large superpositions, but there wouldn't be any information involved. It could have happened at the early universe in the, during the Big Bang, for example, when, uh, for example, some people think that the universe was in superposition during the Big Bang, during the period of inflation, and reached a critical threshold right at the end of inflation, and then collapsed to one universe.